Welcome to POTUS 2016 and to our analysis of the first Democratic debate. We're here each week at this hour calling the presidential horse race and delving into one issue with a scholar who can pour cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Today a study explains why our democracy is not preventing inequality. First though, Yes, the horse race. Hard to see which jockey is ahead there. So let's take a look at some post-debate numbers. The website predictit.org treats the candidates as corporations and invites the world to bid their share prices up and down. This is a project of Victoria University in New Zealand. In this case, Predictit asked which candidate would see the best polling impact from the debate among people who watch the debate. Clinton hit roughly 60 cents a share. Bernie Sanders only half that, about 33 cents. Governor Martin O'Malley, 19 cents. Former Virginia Senator Jim Webb and Lincoln Chafee, about a nickel. Of course, this is not a scientific sample of U.S. voters, but it is interesting that Clinton and Sanders both earn high predictive values after people watch the debate, while Governor O'Malley and others, who perhaps hoped for a Carly Fiorina-like breakout moment, were not expected by respondents to benefit much from their performances. Now on to the substance of the debate. Economics and inequality were central. CNN's moderator Anderson Cooper wanted to know if Senator Sanders' self-described socialist views were too radical for him to be electable. So he asked Sanders, you don't consider yourself a capitalist? Do I consider myself part of the casino capitalist process by which so few have so much and so many have so little, by which Wall Street, greed and recklessness wreck this economy? No, I don't. I believe in a society where all people do well, not just a handful of billionaires. Just uh, let me just be clear. Is there any bill, anybody else on the stage who's not a capitalist? Well, let, let, let me just follow up on that, Anderson, because when I think about capitalism, I think about all the small businesses that were started because we have the opportunity and the freedom in our country for people to do that and to make a good living for themselves and their families. And I don't think we should confuse what we have to do every so often in America, which is save capitalism from itself. So what does that interchange tell us about these two front runners? For their take on the debate, especially the economics, Catherine Rampell, Washington Post columnist who specializes in economic issues, and Bob Herbert, former New York Times columnist, now a fellow at Demos, the Liberal Policy Center. Welcome to both of you. <laughs> How are you? Brian? Good to be here. Uh, Bob, do you think Hillary Clinton took the right tack there, jumping in when Anderson Cooper threw it over or open to the group and pretty much said, yeah, I'm a capitalist and small <laughs> business is the reason why. Yeah, I think she took the right tack politically for her. I think it was helpful um, for her. I think it's a little weird that at this late date, Americans are still so weirded out over the mere term uh, socialism. But I, I don't think Bernie Sanders has done well in defining the kind of socialism that, that he believes in. I mean, he is not far off the American mainstream when it comes to economic matters, but he's being portrayed often by the media uh, last night um, by Hillary Clinton as though he is really very extreme economically. Yeah, and when he doesn't define it very clearly in historical terms, I think he leaves himself kind of vulnerable, like he didn't say, I'm not a Soviet communist, <laughs> where it's authoritarian and there's no democracy in it. He did say democratic socialism, uh, socialist, but he also doesn't say that he doesn't believe in the government owning the businesses, which is what true socialism is. Right, but nonetheless, I think that there's a lot of concern, even amongst his own base, that America would never elect someone with that with that word in their affiliation, even if there are other adjectives crammed in there also. Um, and I think he didn't really do himself any favors by not presenting a, a great sales pitch for, for why we shouldn't fear the S word, essentially, in the same way that once upon a time right. we feared the L word. So if what they're both for is for a capitalism that's regulated when it gets excessive, uh, here's another example uh, from the debate of Martin O'Malley, in this case, talking about, and watch how he turns to Hillary Clinton on this, um, talking about how he thinks that the old Glass-Steagall law, that's the old law that was repealed during President Clinton's administration, 
that separated commercial banks from Wall Street investment firms that took a lot of risks, that that should be reinstated. Watch this. We need to separate the casino, speculative, mega bank gambling that we have to insure with our money from the commercial banking, namely reinstating Glass-Steagall. Secretary Clinton mentioned my support eight years ago. And Secretary, I was proud to support you eight years ago, but something happened in between. And that is, Anderson, a Wall Street crash that wiped out millions of jobs and millions in sa of savings for families. And we are still just as vulnerable, Paul Volcker says today. We need to reinstate Glass-Steagall, and that's a huge difference on this stage I, I, among us as candidates. I, I do just um, so, Bob, um, Hillary doesn't want to reinstate Glass-Steagall, <laughs> but Sanders and O'Malley both do. Why, after the financial crisis, wouldn't somebody want to do that? Well, Hillary's in a tough position. As you mentioned, Glass-Steagall was repealed uh, during the Bill Clinton uh, administration. But I also think that Hillary is not as liberal, even though she's trying to present herself as a more progressive candidate uh, recently, uh, in large part because of the pressure coming from uh, Bernie Sanders. I mean, she's, she's really not that liberal when it comes to these economic issues. I don't believe that she wants a reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, and she certainly doesn't want to break up the big, too, too big to fail banks. I, You're smiling. Well, I, I don't know that that means necessarily that she's not tough on Wall Street, that she's in bed with Wall Street, which are usually the, the claims that are kind of hurled at her uh, because she's taken quite a bit of funding from, um, from financial folks over, the, over the, the last few years. You know, I think there are a lot of economists who don't really think that reinstating Glass-Steagall is going to make that big of a difference. If you look at what caused the financial crisis, at the, at the epicenter of the financial crisis, you had Lehman Brothers, you had Bear Stearns, you had AIG, none of which would be affected one way or the other by that firewall that's essentially and that was, place. And that was part of Hillary Clinton's answer last night, uh, that there are, quote, shadow banks, which is companies that we don't think of as banks that actually do a lot of lending, that were responsible for a lot of the financial crisis, and we need to watch them separately. In fact, let's look at a Sanders-Clinton exchange on this topic. In my view, Secretary Clinton, you do not, Congress does not regulate Wall Street Wall Street regulates Congress, and we have got to break off these banks. Going to them so, and saying, please do the right thing no, that's is not kind what, of that, naive. Look, I think Dodd-Frank was a very that. good start, and I think that we have to implement it. We have to prevent the Republicans from ripping it apart. We have to save the Consumer Financial Protection Board. So can we say that the Sanders-O'Malley position is maybe too simplistic for what's needed, and I, she has I a mean, more sophisticated understanding? I, I don't have a great grasp of all of the things that are on Sanders' menu and O'Malley's menu. I, I have a better sense of some of the things that Hillary has called for, and I do think that a lot of her measures are tougher than she has been given credit for, and that to some extent this, this point about Glass-Steagall is a bit of a distraction. I don't think Hillary's position is much different from Bill Clinton's position when he was president. Uh, you know, Glass-Steagall was done away with then, but not only that, it was sort of the Bob Rubin economic policy that prevailed then, and I don't see a radical departure from that now. And I think that one of the things, Anderson Cooper could have done a better job last night. He should have pushed the uh, too-big-to-fail um, issue. If these banks, which were too-big-to-fail at the time of the crisis, are in fact larger now, well, then what that means is that if one of them was about to cave, we would bail them out again. That was not explored in the debate. But what do we make of that? Does that mean, because I think you're suggesting that the Clintons are captives of the banking industry to too large a degree. Is it really that? I wouldn't or is say, it that they I wouldn't think say, that, I wouldn't that the say, economy I, might no. actually benefit by having some looser rules as long as they can <laughs> That's what they in the said banks. in the 90s, and we saw what happened. Now, I'm not using the term a captive of the banks. But my, uh, my strong belief is that, I'm a very liberal person, my strong belief is that they are not in favor of the kind of regulations and oversight that these too big to fail banks really need if you're going to protect the economy at large, and especially if you're going to reshape the economy so that it helps more ordinary people. And O'Malley did call it too big to jail mm -hmm. at one point. But then Hillary Clinton responded that her 
legislation would actually send people to jail, more individuals, not right. just fine corporations, if things like this happen in the future. Right. That was one of the planks of her um, proposal that she released, I guess it was last week, wherein she talked about in instituting a financial transaction tax, um, making sure that when people do bad things, they go to jail, which is, of course, very easy to say and, and harder to actually execute. Um, and she has also indicated that, you know, we shouldn't have these sort of no-fault settlements, which is what we've had quite a few of since the financial crisis. All right, let's go on to paying for college. This is one of mm -hmm. the biggest concerns in the country right now. <clears throat> and here is Bernie Sanders uh, saying that all um, community college should be free or all public colleges should be free. Is this pie in the sky? Watch this. A college degree today, Dana, is the equivalent of what a high school degree was 50 years ago. And what we said 50 years ago and 100 years ago is that every kid in this country should be able to get a high school education regardless of the income of their family. I think we have to say that is true for everybody going to college. I think we don't need a complicated system, which the secretary is talking about. Your income goes up, your income is down. If you're poor, you have to work and so forth and so on. All right. Catherine, is it clear from what Sanders has laid out how he would pay for public college, and he didn't say community college, so it's two-year or four-year college, being free for the student. Well, he, he said there and he has said elsewhere that basically it'll be funded by taxes, right? That, that we'll have a more progressive tax system um, and that that in and of itself will fund it. And I think tying it back to the previous conversation, he would tax speculative investments right. by banks and dedicate that as a stream to pay for public colleges. Right, now whether it's uh, feasible or not to have free higher education in this country, I completely agree uh, with Bernie that you really need a college education if you're gonna have a middle class standard of living nowadays. We did say half a century ago that everyone should be able to afford a high school education. I think college should be affordable, and I think it's crazy that kids come out of college with this overwhelming debt hanging around their shoulders. Uh, now, how you pay for it is something that should have been explored more in the debate as well. He says a financial transactions tax, whether that would raise enough money to do it or not, I don't know. And Clinton wants a lower interest rate for students taking out student loans, even if they have to get some loans, and she also thought there should be a work requirement for students who and, are getting... And that people who currently have student loan debt should be able to refinance it at lower rates. So it's not right. just the new cohorts of people enrolling in school, but yes, existing but student But once debt. again, she would have to get the private banking system to agree to lend money at a lower rate than they do now, mm -hmm. or to allow refinancing, which they don't on student <laughs> loans. How can the government get the banks to do that? Well, we've... we've <laughs> strongly regulated student lending in the past um, and and we do have a set rate for what students pay now um, on their debt and that's that's you know that, that's not just set by the market right there's a lot of intervention in this uh, market already by government so I think we know what the tools are the question is um, what are the additional risks that you take on when you lower that rate across the board because a lot of student loan debt um, huge, number, huge amounts of student loan get debt goes into default already, and so you have a lot of financial consequences if you're actually charge if you're not charging for that higher risk. Um, it's not fair, but <laughs> of, of course, you know. But but there's a reason why the, the interest rate is high, and you have to be able to figure out how to pay for that. Quick political question before we move on to our next segment: Does the result of this debate argue to Joe Biden? that he should get into the race or not get into the race or neither. I thought that was one of the most important aspects of the debate. I think Hillary did do well. I thought, I thought Bernie did well also, but Hillary certainly did. And I think that Joe Biden is, if he's not checkmated, he's in check at the moment. I think it's very difficult for him to enter the race now. There's no real rationale for him to jump in. Why as a result of the debate? If there was a rationale because 24 the, the, the hours ago. the real rationale for uh, Joe Biden to come in was that Hillary's campaign was, was wavering and that she was becoming weaker and weaker as a candidate. And there was a question as to whether she could actually defeat a Republican candidate. I think that there, there was a sea change uh, in that thinking after the debate. She did emphasize her role as the only woman in the debate over and over again. Many times, yes. Differently than in 2008, I thought. 
And Bernie Sanders explicitly let her off the hook on the emails, which is what the media has been obsessing on. So, so do you think all of this means Hillary Clinton's campaign is in a better position than it was last week? I think there's no question that she performs better when she's talking about policy issues and when she's not talking about <laughs> her emails. Um, so the the setting in, in which she found herself last night was likely to put herself in a better light. And then she performed with a great amount of polish and confidence, which helped as well. All right. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Coming Brian. up next, we'll see what academic research has to say about the relationship between economics and democracy. It's time for evidence-based politics. A new research paper suggests that the donations from the rich to not just the GOP but to the Democrats too, in and of themselves, present a challenge to equality. That if you want to know the direction of public policy, follow the donors. Joining our group via Skype is a co-author of the paper, Why Hasn't Democracy Slowed Rising Inequality, which was published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. He is Nolan McCarty, Professor of Politics and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Professor, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you? Good. First, would political theory suggest that democracy would prevent inequality? That's, that's been an argument going back to Aristotle, that uh, democracy is a cure uh, for inequality. So it's found in Aristotle all the way through the works of modern political economists. The idea is that when income inequality rises, uh, most people will be worse off and they'll use their votes as a correction. But that's not what we found in the contemporary United States. And you suggest five possible reasons for this. We'll go through a few. One of them is that the rich are able to use their wealth to influence policy more than in the past. And I want to put up a graph. Um, this shows the average national income share of the top 0.01 percent, that's the bottom blue line, versus the average a concentration of their campaign donations. In other words, Professor, tell me if I'm looking at this right. The top one one hundredth of one percent of earners aren't getting that much richer, the lower line, but they're the ones funding campaigns more than ever before, the graph going up and up and up. That, that's correct. Uh, they actually are getting quite a bit richer. Uh, this is a finding going back that's uh, attributed to Piketty and Saez. It's just that their uh, con the level of their increased contributions is well dwarfed. Uh, their increase of the national income. And, uh, and do we know why that is? Is there a theory or a hypothesis or is there empirical, empirical evidence that demonstrates why the richest of the rich are spending more of their money on politics? It's not the case that they're, that they're spending more of their money as a percentage or that their contributions are going up faster than their income. Uh, it's just simply that uh, they're, getting so, they're getting so much richer uh, they traditionally have been very concentrated in donating, donating and so it just has this outside, outsized impact. Um, so, so it's, it's not, not just that Citizens United allows them to do it. Everybody says Citizens United, Citizens United. It's that the rich, the richest people in the country are now so rich that they can put money into politics in a way that doesn't affect them but that dwarfs everybody else's money and the amount that they're able to put in. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. It's really a function of the increased uh, economic inequality uh, that's produced uh, a massive uh, response in terms of political inequality. And how does that um, impact policy? Well, political scientists have debated for a long time the extent to which campaign contributions affected policy. And much of the research which was done in the late 1980s and early 1990s was pretty skeptical that there was a big impact. Uh, but it becomes very clear that we perhaps were looking at the wrong place. Uh, political scientists uh, now tend to think in terms of the counterfactual. What policies would politicians have taken if they were not so uh, beholden uh, to large financial contributors? So here's. Uh, so I might well see a different approach to financial reform, 
different approaches to climate change and so forth if it were not for the fact that both parties have uh, donors uh, whose interests are at stake and, and provide uh, quite a lot of the campaign financing in this country. And here's another one of your graphs that we want to show uh, that kind of indicates that this money from, <clears throat> from the top 0.01 percent is going to mainstream candidates, quote unquote, from both parties. Explain what we're looking at here. Okay, so th this is a graph where we're basically, by looking at the campaign contributions of specific individuals. And the individuals are at the top, folks. You can see George Soros, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Sheldon Adelson, the Koch brothers. So it goes from donors on the left to donors on the right. Go ahead. That's, cor that's correct. So we have, we have, indi we have individuals. And uh, it is true that uh, there are some contributors that are kind of uh, uniformly uh, progressive or contributors are uniformly conservative. But as you stated, many are uh, somewhat in the middle. Uh, and that reflects not that these are moderate donors, uh, but simply that many times their campaign contributions go to influence the members of both parties. Uh, and so if you look at the middle of that spectrum, uh, we see people uh, making contributions uh, across the aisles in order to influence uh, policymakers on both sides. So we have big money concentrated on the right, big money concentrated on the left, but the money in the middle is not necessarily the exclusive preserve of moderates. Uh, it's simply uh, wealthy people trying to influence uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle. So let me bring our journalists back into this. Bob Herbert, Catherine Rampell. Um, what do you make of that graph and this distribution of money <clears throat> from major donors who are on, you know, across the political spectrum and its influence on inequality. Well, I think what we're seeing is a profound loop here um, because the very wealthy can make so much, such huge uh, contributions, they have an outsized influence on policy and they use that influence to increase their own wealth. So it's, it's sort of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy there. And, and I think that it really uh, hampers the functioning of democracy overall because ordinary people just don't have a real say in policy. Catherine, anything you as a journalist might want to ask the professor? Um, well, I, I, the paper that I think we're talking about, uh, that, that some of these points came from, also mentions that part of the problem is that it's not just about uh, where the donations come from, but who votes, right? And rich people vote in much higher numbers than, than poor people do. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about... Um, why that is, and is that something that's universally true in other countries where essentially higher income people have an outsized influence on policy because they're more democratically active? Uh, that's right. So it, it is a pretty universal uh, finding that higher income people uh, vote and participate in elections much more than lower income people. The only places where that's not true are the countries with compulsory voting. And since everyone votes, the turnout rates of the both income groups are about the same. But it's important to note about the U.S. that um, the income inequality among voters has not really changed since, 1970, uh, since 1972. So that in and of itself is not a reason for increased inequality. Uh, the one caveat, however, is that, uh, note I said citizen, uh, the United States now has about 10% uh, of its residents who are uh, not citizens uh, or are disenfranchised felons who can't participate. Uh, and so that skews the, the electorate uh, in an upward direction uh, quite quite a lot. So it's really not vote. It's really not voting. I think that's doing it. That's why I think the campaign finance story is uh, much more uh, important. This all makes a certain common sense to a lot of people. Uh, but you're a researcher. You're an academic. Is there empirical evidence? Is this testable? Is this measurable? Um, this relation. <clears throat> excuse me. This relationship. Uh, between uh, campaign co contributions and policy? Yes, and inequality. Uh, and inequality. Uh, y yes, it is, I think. Uh, perhaps not in the same way that we used to test for it. But kind of a typical study in the 1980s and 1990s would be to look to see whether or not a member of Congress voted in a way consistent with the preferences of their contributors. Of course, contributors give to like-minded people, so it's not surprising that you know once you control for whether a member is a liberal or a conservative, that the money doesn't explain much of the vote. But what money seems to do is it, it seems to provide an opportunity 
uh, to participate. There's kind of a floor of financing that one needs uh, to get to be a candidate. Uh, and it's very clear that as campaigns have gotten more expensive uh, and the funders of those campaigns have become more uh, have become wealthier, uh, that the types of candidates who are going to be able to participate uh, in our system are going to be those who have policy preferences closer to, uh, to the wealthy. So, so I think that's the mechanism, and I think that's something that uh, you know we're we're in the midst of testing. Thank you very much. And in our last few seconds, this was a topic in the Democratic debate. It has not been a topic in the Republican debates. Right. What do you think happens, Catherine, real quick, when we get to the general election? Do the Republicans get forced to address inequality in a way that's more than just, oh, well, if rich people are allowed to get richer, then they'll create jobs and it'll trickle down. Well, so I, I would make two points. I actually don't entirely agree with you that this hasn't been an issue in the Republican uh, primary, in part because Donald Trump has been bringing it up a lot, right? I mean, one of his big selling points is supposedly that he's, no, he's not a puppet of the rich. Good point. Um, the way that his, his fellow candidates are. Because he is the rich, so he doesn't have to exactly. take these campaign donations. Exactly. I mean, that doesn't mean necessarily that he has the, the right policy preferences, but he's saying that he's not controlled by someone else. Right. Um, Republicans have been trying to address inequality as a talking point, not terribly convincingly, in my view. Um, you hear, I feel like we heard a lot of candidates name-checking inequality, um, uh, median income stagnation, issues like that in the last maybe six months ago especially. Um, and they all kind of promised that they would do something about that, but then the policies that came out of those promises were primarily trickle-down economics and, and other things that have not really contributed to reversing that trend. Bob Herbert, a last word? Uh, I just think that the Republicans, I think they'll be forced to address the issue during the campaign, but I think they'll address it with the same policy solutions. They will argue that the policy solutions favored by the rich and by the huge campaign uh, contributors are the best policies for ordinary working Americans. Thank you both very much. And that is POTUS 2016 for this week. We are here each week at this hour calling the presidential horse race and confronting campaign rhetoric with research. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.